If you want to find Second Peter chapter 1, hold on to that in just a little while. We'll get to it um, probably about a third of the way into the message. Um, let me do this before we get into that. I want to go ahead and make an announcement, first of all, uh, for the 22nd. Um, Kyle Finley is retiring from doing a safety program called uh, Liveline Demo. And so uh, to, to kind of end it, we're actually going to uh, host him here, and he is going to uh, he's going to present his electrical safety program on the 22nd, which is a Wednesday night. And I think that's in, in in like two weeks or a week and a half. <coughs> okay, and so I invite you to come out and just be a part of that. Um, if you've never seen his program, um, it is it is really a great program, and he just uh, in fact, let me put it like this uh, in in the years that he's presented it um, he has literally saved lives and uh, so I just want you to, to to think about coming out and uh, just supporting him um, you know celebrating with him as he does one of his last programs uh, here and so that's the 22nd uh, <coughs> then there there seems like there was something else and I can't remember um, It may come to me. If it does, it does. If it does, I'll tell you about it. You all know that. Oh, I know what it was. It's this. It's this, and this is very important um, because uh, the message this morning, <coughs> okay, uh, is is from a message that was preached by Vadi Bakum. Now, Vadi Bakum is a minister, and he's in Houston, Texas, but he's also one of the leading ap apologists. Um, he goes to, to universities. Uh, uh, all the time. He and Dr. Ravi Zacharias are probably the two leading uh, apologists, along with some others that you may know. Um, but they're doing a great work. And so I want you to understand that this morning, the outline that you're going to see and a little bit of the information that you, you hear is, is out of his message, okay? And, and here's the deal with that. There, I've, I've run it through my life. I've, I've run into people who um, they're they're all for taking somebody else's message and and uh, making it their own and and, and I'll tell you uh, and there are people who have a problem with that from time to time. Here, here's what I'll tell you: two things. There's nothing new under the sun, okay. And the other thing is, is I fully support and believe, and he just does a great job of presenting it. And so um, I'm going to be sharing the outline. And, and some of the information, the illustrations, of course, are, I mean, they're mine. The introduction is mine. The conclusion is mine. I mean, and, and in the body, that you know, all that stuff is mine. Now, some people will be saying, you don't need to say all that. I do, because I want to give credit to Dr. Bacham, okay? And I also want you to understand that, you know, because just in case there's somebody that's like, I can't believe he's just stealing somebody else's message, um, it, it ain't stealing. I, I'm borrowing it, and and here's here's what I'll say. I'm sorry. Secondly, too bad if you don't like it, because all of this stuff is is fully things that that, that I would support. And, and so um, we're going to look at this morning. Um, maybe. Yeah, why I choose to believe the Bible. Um, we're in a series which is kind of apologetics, if you will. And as we begin the new year, one of, the, one of my goals is basically to, to, to teach on this subject, simply you know, why we believe in God, and, you know, why we believe in Jesus, why we believe in the gospel, why you should be part of a congregation, uh, part of the church. Okay? And, and so when we come to these questions, there's probably nothing that is scrutinized anymore in our world today than people questioning the authenticity and the historicity of this book, okay? And, and, and so understand that um, there, there are folks who, who, who stand up against God's word, I mean, in, in, in our universities, um, in our government, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. They may be some of your friends, they may be family members, and they, they constantly and consistently question it, Okay? And, and, and so understand that that shouldn't be, come as any surprise to us. Jesus said 
that if we set our, our hearts and our minds to him, that we're going to become enemies of this world. And we're living in a day and age when we have a lot of enemies, amen? I mean, they are out there. And, and, and so um, this, this book um, even tells us, Paul writes in, <coughs> writes in 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 4, that the time will come when people won't put up with sound doctrine any longer. In fact, what they do, will do is they'll gather around them teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. And my goodness, aren't we living in that time when, when people are just um, wanting to hear, uh, be, be, uh, um, you know, be encouraged in, 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 in their belief and how they feel and what they think. And, and so they, they gather around them. Anybody that, that uh, will, will hear them or, or that, that will tell them what, exactly what they want to hear. And, and so I love that last line in this passage. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. Now, I don't love the fact that that's happening. I just love the fact that we can be reassured that we're living in a day and age, and we have been living throughout the, you know, the, the centuries. We're living in a time when we are set against the world, and we should not be surprised that people will turn their ears from the truth, and they'll turn them towards myths. And that's exactly what they're doing. Um, but, but, but here's what Scripture also says. Okay, it, it, it says that in our hearts we're to set apart Christ as Lord and we're to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that we have. And then it says to do that with gentleness and respect. Now I have to tell you that sometimes it's very difficult to do it with gentleness and, and respect because of how the tactics that other people use against the scriptures um, because of the attitude that many people bring in um, with uh, the scriptures and about the scriptures, you know, that they stand so firmly and, and even rudely against the truth of God's word, it's hard to do it with gentleness and respect, isn't it? Amen? I mean, I just sometimes, I sometimes when, God, when, when, when people begin to question the truth, and they question God's word, and they question God and the authenticity and, and the fact that it is historically true, this, this story of God's love for us. There's sometimes when they almost become fighting words. But here's the deal. We're told by Peter that we're to do it with gentleness and respect. But, but don't, please don't misunderstand. We are still to fight. We fight, we just fight differently. We fight with the truth. Set apart, or put your heart, set your hearts apart in Christ as our Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. Now, here's what I want you to also understand, that the goal of this message, I mean, this message this morning, by the way, this is just part one. I mean, I'm being nice to you, okay? Because, uh, in fact, you were going to get the whole bunch last Sunday. And, and when, when, whenever the, the blizzard came, uh, I kind of looked at things, and Robbie and I talked, and I said, I better split this into two, uh, because, I, you know, you guys would just, uh, you'd be asleep or something. Um, so, so anyway, uh, we're to give an answer, okay? And, and, and that answer, I want you to understand, it's, it's really not about defending the truth. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, it makes no more sense to defend the Bible than it does to defend a lion. You just, you don't defend a lion, you just turn it loose. I mean, that's the same thing with uh, God's word. It says that it's like a double-edged sword, that it will cut to the very, uh, is Megan in here? So I, I don't know if I said, it cuts to the very marrow, or marrow. Is it marrow that she tells me that it is? It is marrow? I told you, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, yeah, to the very marrow. I mean, it cuts into the bone. And so you don't need to defend it, but what we're supposed to do is be able to give an answer. Now, the sad part is a lot of people can't give an answer. They can't give an answer for why we believe in the authenticity and the historicity of the Scriptures. And so my goal is to help you have an answer, okay? So I would really encourage you to write some of these things down. Um, if, if you're... 
if, if you really want to grow in, in being able to have an answer for your friends and your family, then write some of these things down, okay? Because our, our goal is to give you an answer. And here's something else I'll tell you before we get into it. When it comes to answering questions or answering doubts that other people have, please understand that even if you have these answers, it may not make a difference to them. Okay? You know, our job is not to convince them. Our job is simply to tell them. Do you get that? I mean, I hope you understand that because that's, that's really our job. It's just simply to tell them. And then the Holy Spirit takes over. And the truth takes over and, and and so you know understand that all we're looking at is being able to give an answer for the hope that we have our job is not to change them all right so why i choose to believe the bible and i want to begin with a couple of wrong answers okay these these are answers that people give all the time in the church i've heard them before you know as we've talked well here's why i believe the bible and the first wrong answer is this that that's the way I was raised. That, that's just the way I was raised. Now, you, all, you should automatically hear the problem in that one. You see, the problem is they can turn right around and say to you, well, that's not the way I was raised. Okay? So it's, it's really not a good answer. In fact, it's not a good answer also because some of the things we were taught as kids were not true. I mean, any of you remember this? If you keep making that face, it's going to stick that way. Mine never did. And I still keep making faces, and it never has. My personal favorite is this one. Miles, I want you to know that this is going to hurt me <laughs> more than it does you. Evidently, my mom had never been on the receiving end of one of her own whippings. So, so that's the way I was raised. But, but I mean, the, the major issue is that what we come to it with is a bunch of presuppositions or, or, you know, we have experiences and we have background. You know, we have all of that that we carry with us. And, and, and here's the deal. So do they. And so they're just going to counter everything that we say. Well, that's the way I was raised. You know, that's, we were, I mean, Bill, Bill White and I were talking a little bit before um, the service. And, and we were talking about just how... I, I, I love listening to Bill, by the way, because he, he, he kind of puts it out there like it is. And so he said, we're spoiled today. He said, I can remember when I was a kid that, you know, last weekend, he said, it was all winter like that. It, the snow would be so high, it covered up the fence post, and the cows would get out because they'd walk over the, the fence post or, or the fence, you know. And, and, and so we were just talking about, you know, uh, some of the some of the things that he experienced now here's the deal and some of you may not know this some people in my generation may may not really be able to relate to that but I can because it, you know my mom was a single mom and we grew up kind of poor and, and so one of the things I can tell you is that some of the things that Bill remembers you know I can remember some of those things too Simply because, you know, we heated our house with wood. We had to draw water from the well to drink and to flush the toilets and all that sort of thing. The only difference, we had an outhouse, we just didn't have to use it. All right? Because we had indoor plumbing, we just didn't have running water. Um, because the pumps just didn't work. And so sometimes, I, that's why I love listening to those. But, but, but so, so understand that we don't all have the same experiences and so what people will do is they'll just counter this that's the way i was raised with why well, i wasn't raised that way and so it's not a good argument for um, why we believe the bible the second one is i tried it and it worked for me welcome <laughs> you, congratulations you just made it on par with every infomercial that has ever been made you know sweating to the oldies i tried that and it worked for me um, you know, the, the problem, again, is that someone like Phil Jackson could say, well, I tried Buddhism, and it has brought peace into my life. You know, there's, there's this eternal peace that I enjoy because of, because of Buddha and following his ways. You know, Tom Cruise, he could say Scientology works for me. 
and he does. He talks about it a lot. Um, even Tony Robbins, some of you may not know Tony Robbins, but Tony Robbins is a life uh, coach, and he coaches confidence and success. And, I mean, he's got people who have followed his plan, and they've been very successful. And, and, and so th- this argument just doesn't work. I tried it, and, and it worked for me. So, so I want you to see a... I want you to see an answer, and, and if you want to write that down, I'll leave it up there uh, just for a little bit. But Vadi Bakum uh, came up with, with this statement, and, and i got to tell you, if you're a Christian, there's, there's no better statement about why we believe in this book. And it's really what's based in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Um, Vadi took that passage, and he wrote this statement. And it's a statement that I think that we ought to all hang on to and use. I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They, they report supernatural events that took place in fulfill, fulfillment of specific prophecy and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. All right? And, and so we're going to look at Second Peter verses one, uh, verses sixteen through twenty-one, and um, and I want to go ahead and read through the entire um, the entire passage. Peter writes here and says, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him, on the sacred mountain and we have the the word of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts above all you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so what Dr. Bacham did was he took the scripture and he put it into um, to, to, to these words. And I want to read through them again. I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecy And they claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. I just want to share with you just two headings, two points this morning. And the very first one is this. The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. And what Peter writes is this. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus. But we were eyewitnesses. And so um, the historicity of the Bible, it's not just the authenticity that's challenged, it's the fact of understanding it as a historical document. Now here's what you should know about the Bible, and this is some stuff that you can get from me later if you don't pick all this up, but the Bible is basically 66 books written on, uh, by 40 different authors, and it's written on three different continents, that would be Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it's written in three different languages. Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And all of that was written over a period of 1,500 years. Now here's what's so amazing about it. You can go anywhere in here. In the Old Testament. The Old Testament proclaims Jesus. I mean, that's strictly what it's about. It's the story of God bringing redemption to the world. And so all throughout it, it points towards Jesus. 
that's that's the Old Testament. And when you get into some of those books, First Kings and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and you're looking at all that, it's history, folks. It is a written history of the Hebrew people. And 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 as you get into the Gospels, that's exactly what those Gospels are. They are biographies of Jesus. And then the history of the, the church is in the book of Acts. And then you have these letters which help record history. And, and so understand that all of it hangs together. That's the amazing part. They try to find contradictions. They will claim certain contradictions. But I can tell you that there are no contradictions. None. It hangs together, and it's written by 40 different authors on three different continents in three different languages over a period of 1,500 years. And here's the deal. Only God can put that kind of a collection together. Amen? And, and so, you know, those are some things that, that you need to be able to, to, to answer with because it's incredible, this collection of, of God's word that, that we have. Now, it includes dates and names of people and places over a period of 6,000 years. I mean, 6,000 years is, is what this book covers. And yet, all of it hangs together. How can someone say that it is not historically accurate? How can they say that it's, I mean, they'll question the, the authenticity. Now, let me give you just a little bit of proof because there are over 23,000 archaeological digs and none of them offers any evidence to refute the scripture. 23,000 digs that have done, been done. And that includes people who are looking for things to refute the scriptures. But the problem is they can't find anything. All that they ever find are things that confirm the scripture. You may remember a couple of years ago that there was a fellow who uh, had a program on either the History Channel or Discovery or something like that. And basically, it, the story was that he had found Jesus' uh, sarcophagus, okay? A sarcophagus is kind of, it's the box itself. It's got the, the bones uh, in it. And, and what they would do, by the way, is, you know, once... Once those bones um, had, you know, kind of deteriorated or the, the body had deteriorated, <coughs> oftentimes they would be taken out of the tomb and moved somewhere else um, because that tomb could be used again, all right? So he claimed that he found the, the sarcophagus of Jesus. Do any of you remember that by a show of hands? A couple people. And, and, and here's, here's what happened. They aired that program. They, they premiered that program on whatever channel it was on. And they did it knowing that a year prior, he had been disproven. So they went ahead and aired it. And here's the thing. Your, your family, and, and maybe even some of you, because every once in a while I get people, well, I saw it on Discovery Channel. Folks, stop listening to what they have on Discovery and, and History Channel and start opening your Bibles. Because the world is against us. And I don't care if they have some guest on there. Because the guest is made to look like an idiot if he believes in the authenticity and the historicity of the Bible. Their goal is to, to bring God's truth down to simply a matter of opinion. And, 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 and let me just cover that real quick. Because honestly, it is a matter of opinion. I mean, it is. People choose to not believe it. That's their opinion. Our job is to present a, a truth and a hope of why we believe, uh, why we have hope. Because we know that this is true. We know because as Peter writes, we, we have eyewitnesses. We have, um, we, we have a, a Bible that is, that is true. All, all right. So, so here's, here's the example that I love to give um, for, for the Bible, okay, for the archaeological finds. Back in the, the late, um, well, for, for centuries, people have questioned uh, the, the uh, uh, historicity, uh, the accuracy of, of the history. They have questioned it because uh, they find things that they question. One of them was Hezekiah. King Hezekiah 
was a king of Judah. He ruled in Jerusalem during um, uh, the, the Assyrian reign. Okay, The Assyrians had a kind of a world empire. They had already destroyed um, uh, Israel, the northern kingdom. And so now they're attacking the, the southern kingdom. We have that record, record in 2 Kings 18 and 1 uh, Chronicles 32, I believe, is where you can read about Hezekiah. But see, people were claiming, they said, that in that day and age, we can't find any record, we can't find anything that is written down outside of the Bible that talks about Hezekiah. Now, other, some of the other kings um, were, were, were listed in, in, in other documents from other nations, but Hezekiah wasn't. And so they, they questioned, you know, the authenticity and, and, and how accurate the history was of the scriptures until 1830. When Colonel Robert Taylor discovered in the city of Nineveh, you guys remember Nineveh? That's where Jonah went. He discovered in, in Nineveh a, a prism. Not a prison, but a prism. Now, a prism is a stone, okay? And it's this monument. And on the stone, it mentions Hezekiah. It, it mentions some of the kings from Israel. And, 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 and so then, then also in 1919, in an in a, in a antique shop in Baghdad, someone else came across what is called this black obelisk. It's called Hezekiah's Prism. And if you ever want to see it, just drive to Chicago, and, and it is there. I think it may be a replica, but it, it is, it, you can see it at the, the Oriental Art Institute in Chicago. And I absolutely love the story because it says on, the, on this stone that, that you know, was... was uh, was buried for so many years, and, and they, someone found it, and it's, it's been purchased, and it's been placed there. It said, Hezek I had Hezekiah caged in Jerusalem like a bird. And that's exactly what 2 Kings 18 and 1 Chronicles 32 talks about, how Hezekiah is there, and Assyria has come to, to destroy Jerusalem and Judah. And if you know the rest of the story, the death angel, the angel of the Lord, comes, and he destroys the Assyrian army, and so they leave them alone. So, so understand that all that happens in these digs is that they only serve to confirm the Bible. Um, 23,000 of them, and nothing has been found to refute the scriptures. Now, it offers strong internal evidence as well. In fact, if you would turn to Luke, turn to the book of Luke, um, Chapter 1. Luke writes there and says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And so Luke begins the book by, by basically saying, I'm going to be precise, I'm going to be factual. Um, and, and Luke, listen, Luke, and, and I'm not knocking the apostles because, you know, they were fishermen and and. And yet, what, what you should understand, remember that when they went to the Sanhedrin, one of the questions that they had is, aren't these uneducated fishermen? And yet they preached with power. You know, they preached with, with courage. They were changed because of the resurrected Christ. The thing I want you to, 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 to note about Luke is he's a physician. I mean, he's an educated person. And, and so what he writes here is he says, I'm going to be precise, I'm going to be factual. Um... So, the thing is, if, if, any, of this, if any of this kind of, um, you know, went the direction of, of being untrue, you know, there, there would have been people at the time who would, have, who would have questioned his writings. And that's the wonderful thing about it, because it also is amazingly detailed. And so, if someone was mentioned, I mean, if someone was mentioned... You could go to them. If you lived at that time, you could go to them and you could say, hey, did that really happen? I mean, did, did it really happen, what we're reading in there? Hey, one of the places that I think is just, uh, I think it's in um, 
first or second Timothy, where Paul mentions Alexander the coppersmith. I mean, he, he, he mentions his name, and then he says what his trade is. So Alexander the coppersmith. And, and so he writes to the church and says, I man, I had a lot of trouble with Alexander the coppersmith. And, 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 and again, here's the deal. When people read that letter, they could have gone. They could have gone to Alexander. Is this true? Did you guys have some conflict? Or, or how about, how about uh, the fact that Simon Peter uh, stayed with Simon the Tanner in Joppa? Now, this is before he goes and he, he, he preaches to Cornelius' household, but he's staying with a tanner. By the way, I, that's, that's kind of amazing to me because of all the things that happened, he is at a tanner's house. Do you know what tanners do? What do tanners do? They make leather, and that's part of it. Um, but, but in order to make the leather, what do they have to deal with? Dead animals. So what, what did that make Alexander, or not Alexander, Simon the Tanner? What? Unclean. You know, now not under the new system, but under the old system. And so Peter is staying with a tanner who, you know, in, in his old belief system, that would have made him completely unclean. For, for even being in the house. And, and yet, then the dream that he has is all these unclean animals coming down. Get up, go kill and eat. By the way, this wasn't in my script or my message, but I, I just thought I'd educate you to that too. But, um, you know, basically, it's incredibly detailed. People could have gone to, to anyone to dispute this. I mean, it's easy to dispute something from, from so long ago, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to some of that in just a little bit. But, but it's amazingly detailed. The second heading or point that I would make this morning is it's written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, and that's what Peter says there. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God, the father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying this is my son whom I love with whom I am well pleased we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain and so Peter states that the disciples were eyewitnesses to his majesty and they saw it all if you remember the three that saw it were Peter James and John they went up with him on the mountain of transfiguration and they saw his glory now can you imagine what it would be like to, to walk with Jesus Robbie and I spent some time talking about this because we were thinking about our favorite miracles and just imagine being one of the disciples and and my favorite miracle I think that's that's listed is I mean I have a couple of them calming the sea is just incredible to me peace be still I mean what a great what a great just statement he gets up and says be quiet it's calm but but honestly i think my, my most favorite is the widow of name because i think it shows jesus compassion it shows how compassionate he is because i mean he, he being able to, to know all things as she's coming out this funeral procession is coming out of the city of name he realizes that this woman is a widow and that this is her only son. And so he walks over. Again, you can't touch anything dead if you're a Jew. And he walks over and he, he reaches up and he touches the young man. And here's the reason, here's the reason he did it is because this widow was going to be left without anyone to take care of her. And so he simply went over and basically, it's young man, get up. And he got up. I mean, can you imagine being one of the disciples? I'm, Gee, wait, wait, what are you, what are you doing? Jesus, what are you doing? I mean, the, the surprise that they would have, the shock that they constantly had. Can you imagine as, as, as Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, the disciples are over there going, he is nuts. He's crazy. You don't do that. It, w it would be absolutely amazing. And, and Robbie brought this one out. Robbie brought up the one about um, the servant uh, who died. 
and the the commander comes to Jesus and says, "Hey, can you can you come with me?" And on the way, you know, he gets interrupted, and and basically, the commander says, "Listen, you don't have to go with me. I mean, I, I lead men all the time, and all I say is, I I, I can send someone to go and and do it. They follow my command." All you've got to do is speak it, and it'll be done. I believe that. Jesus said, man, there, there is no great, I mean, the, the faith of this individual. And, and, and so Jesus didn't even have to go to the place to, to, to do the miracle. The, the, I mean, just the things that they experienced every day, it would be absolutely amazing. I mean, don't you think? Amen? It, it would just be, just be amazing. Uh, to experience those things. Well, um, after the resurrection, Jesus' disciples saw him on multiple occasions over a period of 40 days. And the largest crowd that, that um, saw in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul records that the largest crowd was over 500. And so there were eyewitnesses. I mean, there were eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. And so as letters were wrote or as stories were told proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus, people could go and say, man, did you see him really? Yes, I saw him. Thomas could say, I, 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 you know, he said to me, you know, touch the wound in my side. Check out the prints in my hand, Thomas. And Thomas could say, I did, and, and those wounds were there. And, and so that's, I mean, that's, that's great, great evidence and yet, people still refuse, refuse to believe. In fact, they, they argue against the authenticity. And I just want to share with you in the remainder of our time two major arguments against, because you'll get hit with them. You, you will get hit with these. The very first one is the multiple translation theory. And this is a favorite of college professors. They love to bring this one up. Because they're dealing with young people who are easily intimidated and, and who, you know, once they get out on their own, they're beginning to form their own worldview. And, and many of them, many of them, some of them being your children, maybe your grandchildren, many of them buy into the, the stuff, I was very nice there, the stuff that the propaganda from our universities Many of them buy into that rather than remembering and hanging on to the truth. And, and so basically what they say is that the Bible has been translated so many times it has not remained true to its origi original message. Now let me say, say something. That, that would be true. That would be true only if what happens is that we take something like the ESV, the English Standard Version, and we translate it from the NIV. And the NIV has been translated from the, the, the New American Standard Bible, and the New American Standard Bible has been translated from the, the New King James, and the New King James, of course, was translated from the Old King James. See, people who carry the King James Bible don't have this problem. They, they can say, oh, no, I got the original version. See, then we'd have a problem. And then, and then it goes back to some of the, the church fathers' writings and that sort of thing. We'd have a problem then. But, but basically, this, this is an argument that they say is kind of like the old uh, telephone game where you whisper in somebody's ear and by the time it gets... 20 places removed, it's no longer accurate. But, but understand this. When someone translates, if it's a translation of the Scriptures, then they have gone back to the original documents. They have gone back to the Greek language. They have gone back to Hebrew. They have gone back um, to, to, uh, to the original languages to translate. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of, 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 of some things in just a little bit on those documents. But um, my frustration is this. They use a rather simple-minded argument that any educated person, they really should know better. Um, because it's, 
it's, it's just their way of being able to intimidate and lead our young people astray. And, and many people are led astray because of it. A very simple-minded argument, if you ask me, because they don't understand. I mean, they're, they're, basically, they're, they're basically proclaiming that they're, can I just say, they're basically proclaiming that they're morons. And I, listen, that may sound mean, but I got to tell you, I get fired up over this. I, I really do. I get fired up over our universities and our colleges and the, and the stuff that they're teaching. I was kind again. Um, it, it makes me mad. And, and so they're using a very stupid argument, and yet our kids are buying it. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, frustrating, a frustrating thing. Well, the, the second argument is the overzealous monk. And here's, here's kind of what this argument is. That during the time of, let's say, Constantine. In fact, let's just say Constantine because this is the argument. Constantine's reign. If you remember Constantine, he, he was a Roman emperor who became a Christian. In fact, he fought under the standard of the cross. Um, and, and Constantine then made Christianity legal in, Ro in, in uh, the Roman Empire. Before that, they had been persecuted, they had been killed, uh, thrown into the uh, arena with lions, uh, with gladiators. Um, some of them had even been used as human torches in the city of Rome. And, and so Constantine comes on the, the scene, and, and, and he makes Christianity legal. Now, some people, they said that he made it the, you know, the national uh, religion, but, but he really didn't do that. Um, you know, his armies fought under the standard of the cross and that sort of thing. But he just simply made it legal. And, and, um, and so what they say is that then he, he went back and, and, and he made Jesus more divine than what he really was. And the way that he did that was he had a, 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 some monks or, you know, a monk. And, and all sorts of theories on this. Um, some, of them, some of them look at it as being a renegade monk who, who decided to make Jesus more divine on his own. I want to show you how difficult that would be. You know, even if Constantine said, go and change all of it. Go, go and change these scriptures and, and, and make it look like Jesus is, uh, that he's performed miracles. Make it look like Jesus is, has done more than he actually has. And, and, and so here's, here's, here's what I want you to understand. If that were true, there are over 6,000 manuscripts there are, there are over 6,000 Greek manuscripts uh, considering the, the New Testament. Because that's really, really that's what we're, we're talking about is the New Testament. Because the Old Testament has been around for so long that many, many uh, skeptics, they don't even deal with the Old Testament. It's strictly the New Testament. We have 6,000 Greek manuscripts. And that's what he would have had to change. Now, here's something I want you to uh, c compare that to. 6,000 documents and manuscripts that proclaim the, the authenticity, that proclaim the historicity that, that, that is historically accurate. And, 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 and so here's some comparisons for you. Caesar's Gaelic Wars, or Gallic Wars, whichever you want to pronounce it, w there are less than 12 copies. And yet much of what we know about the life of Julius Caesar is in, is in, in that kind of... In, in those 12, less than 12 documents, you know, less than a dozen manuscripts. And, and, and it makes it into our history books. Aristotle's Poetics, there's less than 10 copies. You know, some of the philosophy that we know from Aristotle, less than 10 copies. 6,000 documents that, that claim the authenticity and, and the historical accuracy of the bible but 10 copies that are still used to, to translate to bring into our language the thoughts and the philosophies of aristotle um, socrates we have zero manuscripts all that we know about socrates is because of plato plato not plato plato gives us He's the, he, he's the one who gives us the thought and the, you know, the, the realization that there was a man named Socrates and here are some of the experiences. It only comes through Plato's writings, not Socrates. Now, 
what they'll say then, the second argument is this. Well, yeah, you have 6,000 documents, but you don't have any of the originals. And here's the, here's the truth to that. Um, we don't have the originals. The earliest date is around 120 A.D. Now, if you do the math on that, depending on how long Apostle John lived, which we know he lived into the 90s, that's only two and a half to three decades removed from the age of the apostles, 25 years. 25 years after the apostles are the earliest manuscripts that we can find. Okay, now I got a theory on that because I would imagine that the apostles and, and some of the early church, they carried documents with them. They carried um, the scriptures and they hadn't been made into the scriptures yet, but they carried those documents with them. And, and I'm just going to put it out there. As they preached and, and they were confronted and some of them killed, those documents were destroyed. And so the, the earliest copies that we have are 120 A.D. Um, 25 years, two to three decades after the apostles. Now, let's go back and compare those ones that we just looked at. For, for all of those history teachers and philosophy teachers, I mean, let's go back and, and let's get real with this because this is what they're hanging their hats on. Um, the Gaelic Wars, the earliest copy we have is a thousand years after Julius Caesar. In my opinion, let's uh, got to take him out of the history books, folks. H how can that be historically accurate when the earliest document we have is a thousand years later? Someone made up those stories about Caesar. See, that's what they're doing with us. 25 years after the apostles, we have the earliest record. And 6,000 of them. You know, history, what they base it on are less than a dozen copies a thousand years after he lived. It's crazy. Aristotle's Poetics, 1,400 years after they discovered that document. That's when, that's when we have it. So, hey, his philosophies, I mean, isn't it possible that they were tampered with? I mean, can we be sure that 1,400 years later that, that it's historically accurate? Um, or, or Homer's Iliad. I mean, my goodness, if you were in an English class, uh, I'm sure you had to read this. Homer's Iliad was 2,100 years later. How, are, how can we be sure that Homer wrote it? supposed to be funny well, thank you thank you I like a token laugh every once in a while I like a token amen every once in a while I get tired of having to ask for them thank you <laughs> see some people are saying he's got part two next week I ain't coming Homer's Iliad, 2,100 years later. You know, the whole idea is, how are we even sure there was a Homer? I mean, how are we even sure that, that it was written that, that long after? You know, the re by the way, the reason we know is because the, the thing that was found 2,100 years later is the written story. The story has been passed down from the time of Homer. That's how we know um, but that's the earliest document that we have. And, and so, you know, understand just putting things in perspective. Um, the Bible has some pretty good, I mean, it's got some pretty good ammunition behind it. 6,000 documents, 66 books written, uh, you know, by 40 different authors, three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, in three different languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Um, and, and, and so, you know, written over a, a period of 1,500 years, it has 6,000 of, of those, those documents that, that remain about the New Testament. And the earliest one was within two and a half decades, 25 years. Um, here's the second argument with the overzealous monk. Uh, Jesus said, go and make disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples, and they did I mean, as they went, they, they took 
um, the, the scriptures that they had. They took the writings that they had. And early on, early on, the Bible was translated into Syriac, Coptic, and Latin. Those three languages. So now what Constantine would be asking these monks to do is not only transform or, or change the, the, the uh, and I'm going to put it like, like uh, Dr. Bacham does, what he says is uh, this, these, these monks would have to go steal the documents from wherever they were, change the documents and don't show their ink work, and then get them back where they belong. But they wouldn't only have to do that with the 6,000 documents. They'd have to do it with all of the, the translations in Syriac, Coptic, and Latin. They would have to track those down. They would have to take them and, without anybody noticing it and change it. Don't show their ink work and then put it back. All right? And, and so Jesus said, go and make disciples, and they did. And, and so um, the translations would have to be changed as well. Finally, uh, the argument against the overzealous monk were the church fathers. We, we call them church fathers. Um, I heard someone say once, I think it was Ravi Zacharias, that uh, if they were here today, they would be insulted. I mean, they wouldn't want you to call them that. But we call the, the men who, who followed the apostles, okay, because they very much mentored people. And so basically John, and this is, you can, you know, if you don't want a, an example, you can write this down. John mentored a man named Polycarp, and Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. He was one of the church fathers. They are the gentlemen who are responsible for bringing the collection of documents together and calling it the New Testament. So this happened in, you know, the end of the first and, and the beginning of the second century that this, this collection began to be put together and called the New Testament. And, and Polycarp, Origen, you know, I go blank on some of them, but, but Polycarp is probably, if you remember, the Bishop of Smyrna, he lived to be in his 80s, and he was burned at the stake um, for, for his faith. You know, my favorite part about, you know, his, his life is that as they came to take him, he fed the men who were going to be taking him. You talk about Christian hospitality. And, and that's, that's who the church fathers were. They studied under the apostles, or at least apostles you know, like John. And, and so um, Bruce Metzger estimates that 95 to 98% of the Bible is contained in their writings. You know, that's, that's a pretty great percentage. In fact, a study that has been done uh, more, um, you know, since that time is that there are only 11 verses that are in their writings that are not, you know, included from the Bible. Only 11 verses. Everything else you can find in their church writing. What's the point? The point is not only would they have to change the 6,000 documents, not only would they have to change the translations that are in the Syriac, Coptic, and Latin, but they would also have to change the writings of the church fathers. And for all that to happen, it would take 300 years. There's no way that that sort of conspiracy could have taken place. And, and so understand that the Bible written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. It, it is a, an accurate historical document. And again, that's what, that, that's what Peter records here. We, we, didn't do, we didn't write this simply based on invented stories. In fact, skip down to verse 20. What he says is, and I'm going to deal with this next week. He says, what you must understand is that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now,
folks, some might say, well, this, this series or this, even this message didn't do me a whole lot of good. And if, if you're thinking that, can I put it real bluntly? If you're thinking that way, then you need to recheck whether you're a disciple of Jesus. Because disciples care about the truth. And they care about communicating the truth. And they even care about, I spoke about a little bit about this on Wednesday night. You, you, we're going we're gonna to meet people who are on the right, wrong path. And we need to care about that path that they're headed down. And we need to be able to lead them. And, and I'm telling you, I just gave you some great information. Some, some great information. And, and, and you, you can sit there and say, well, why? Because that command, and this is, this is the part that just drives me insane about the church. We hire people and we expect that they're the ones who are going to do it. And what the Bible says is that if you are a disciple of Jesus, then your job is to go and make more disciples. And so that information that you just received is crucial because there are people who are on the wrong path. And we're going to run into people who are almost militant about their beliefs against the authenticity of the Scripture. Again, I just gave you some great information to be able to do battle with them. Now what it comes down to is will we do it? And, 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 and you may ask why. I mean, why do we need to do it? Because th this nation is quickly slipping away from us and from God. In fact, We've departed from God as a nation. And the only way that the church will survive under the pressures that we may face in the future is that more than just the ministers, more than just the elders, that every person, it's a priesthood of all believers. So why should you hang on to this information? Because you are a minister as well. And you need to be able to answer your friend, your family. We're not asking you to go out on a street corner and preach. Some of you may do that. Some of you may want to do that. Some of you have done that. All we're asking is for each one of you to take responsibility for the people that God has placed in your lives and to be able to give them an answer for the hope that lies within. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. And I know, Father, that uh, it's a lot of stuff to take in. Um, but, but I pray, Father, that uh, you know, something that's, that's said in this passage, I pray this morning for this, this group of people here. That, that Father, some of them are, are just probably really even intimidated by the message that was just shared in thinking about being a witness to their family and friends. But Father, would, would you remind us, would, would you place upon each heart and in each mind this morning the promise that is given there in Second Peter in verse 21. That Father, as your disciples, we are carried along by the Spirit. That Father, we have your Spirit, your Holy Spirit living within us. And that, Father, he is going to give us an, an, an answer if we trust in him. That he is going to give us the courage if we trust in him, if we trust in you. And so, Father, this morning, may your spirit fall upon each person here. And, Father, may we respond to the, the calling of, of your heart and the calling of your will. And may, may we be one. Uh, together with you. We pray all this in Christ's name.